I worked at Langley from 1948 until 1992. I think that's 44 years. My major areas of research while working there were uh, lift drag stability, uh, missile configuration development, uh, a major four-stage launch vehicle development called a Scout, uh, structural design criteria development, and uh, aircraft operating systems. I came to uh, I, 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 I came in 1948, but uh, after serving five years in the Royal Air Force, and uh, <clears throat> I, I came back to uh, Brooklyn, where I was raised, and uh, completed my education. I graduated in aeronautical engine in, in a, I got a degree in mechanical engineering with an aeronautical option. And because of my wartime experience as a pilot, I thought I might be interested in flight testing, becoming a flight test pilot. And I thought with a degree and some flying experience that I could get a job as a flight test pilot. But I didn't have enough money to get to California, where all the action was. So I, I accepted a job at Langley Research Center of the NACA came down here on my motorcycle with about 50 bucks in my pocket and uh, was very fortunate to be assigned to a uh, division there called the Pilot Research, Pilotless Aircraft Research Division, <coughs> which was engaged in uh, using rockets to uh, explore the uh, transonic region that was not available for testing in wind tunnels. Wind tunnels at about Mach number 0.8 uh, choked and uh, stayed choked until about Mach number 1.2. After that, supersonic wind tunnels could be used, but in that, in that uh, transonic area, uh, there was no other source of information, so we were using rocket models to fly into that range and make measurements of basic aerodynamic parameters, such as lift, drag, st stability, uh, 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 fundamental quantities uh, relative to different uh, airfoil shapes. Uh, in addition, we uh, uh, could take and put a, a, a flight test, a model of a, of a real airplane on the head of a uh, rocket or a and launch it with, with uh, uh, instrumentation to uh, measure its drag and lift and, and stability and other properties. Initially, the flight uh, test range was uh, low subsonic, low subsonic or high subsonic, 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 up to uh, Mach number one. And as we uh, built bigger models and and faster models, we had to take and increase the number of stages from one stage to two stages, and then three, four, and eventually five stage. Of course, with each additional stage, it increased the complexity, and it increased the range over which these airplane things flew, and the range over which instrumentation had to be gathered, and it over a 10-year period that we had advanced from Mach number 0.8 to uh, Mach 15. And at that point, Mach 15 was uh, 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 a, a speed record of sort. Uh, it was a speed record for uh, uh, any propelled vehicle in 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 uh, the atmosphere and then when was that w what year was that that was a that was about 1957 uh, i think as we got up to mach to uh, that was mach 15 and as we got up to mach 15 that's very close to orbiting speed 
And so we start to think about, well, what do we have to do to take and orbit something? But we were so busy with uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, measuring heat transfer was the principal uh, concern at that speed because the aerodynamic heating was, would, would uh, dominate the, the use of any vehicle in space. And uh, we were sort of doing some basic research on heat transfer, uh, and uh, we, we didn't have much time to think about going into orbit, but uh, we, we couldn't help but think about it. In the meanwhile, in 1958, I think it was, the Russians orbited Sputnik, and that changed the whole ball game. So, uh, at that point, the uh, group that I, in PARD that I worked with, uh, got involved with designing and constructing a four-stage rocket, uh, solid rocket booster that could orbit a 300-pound payload at 300 miles uh, orbit, 300 miles above the Earth. And that development was, was a hectic development over a period of three years. From from scratch, we we bought we you know designed it, bought the pieces, put it together, tested it, made it work, and uh, it eventually became a successful program after a number of failures in the early stages. The uh, I think the total after after about. Eight or twelve, twelve uh, launches. The uh, we, we turned the the uh, construction and uh, launching of the, the the scout vehicle over to a contractor, Chan, Chan's bought. Uh, what what fuel, what kind of fuel were these rockets using? They used solid rocket propellant fuel. Which is an o uh, in which you have a fuel embedded in an oxygen-carrying uh, particles in the uh, in the case, and in the case of the Scout, that was uh, oh, like the first stage was 18 inches in diameter, maybe 20, and then it went down. The stages got smaller as you went up, and the last stage was uh, more like 15 inches in diameter. Uh, we did uh, altogether launch something like 150 or 170 of those uh, scout vehicles before the program ended because the, the market for small payloads disappeared. The, the things got more and more complicated. Let me back up for just a minute to the, the uh, getting in from these models that we were launched from. Where did you launch those from? Launched the model, models from Wallops Island, where uh, the, uh, was a little sandy beach up on off the eastern shore of Virginia, and the uh, the NASA bought half an island called uh, called Chincoteague, and he, he built the facilities there to support l launching uh, the, uh, these tests. There was a dormitory up there where we'd go and stay for a week a little motorboat to take you over to the island, and uh, a ferry for heavy equipment, and we would, uh, a cafeteria for uh, eating when we were there, plus the necessary uh, electronic and uh, tracking facilities and radars to track the, the uh, tests. But they were pretty self-sufficient, and uh, and we would go for a week and stay a week, and then come home. It, it wasn't it wasn't a matter of flying in and flying back like you not you can do now. Uh, what was life like? Uh, you, your downtime. What did you do for entertainment? Played cards, and if there was any spare time, we'd play cards and uh, sit around. Mostly, uh, work was pretty intensive when we went over there because we were always looking for trying to repair things or, or make sure that the upcoming shot would be on time. And to, to get the information back that you needed uh, on lift, drag, these other forces that you were talking about, 
How, how did you get that information? Well, the forces were measured by sensors, like accelerometers, principally, uh, that would, would uh, send a signal to a, a FM transmitter <coughs> that was in hardened to make it withstand the shock of the uh, ignition of the various stages. And that would be transmitted to a receiving station <clears throat> and recorded on tape. Actually, it was, it was recorded on paper, uh, big 12-inch uh, wide consolidated recorder paper tapes. And then it would be up to the engineer to take and read that, the deflections on that tape, which would be proportional to the thing being measured, and uh, evaluate that. Uh, and, and uh, ca calculate the, uh, w what the forces were that they were looking for. Okay. Uh, let me ask you, what, what were the G-forces on acceleration like for those rockets too, that the equipment had to withstand? Could vary from uh, 100 Gs to uh, 10 Gs, or endless. Obviously, the heavier the the payload and the more energetic the uh, rocket, the higher the acceleration. A heavy payload would go slower, and the acceleration would be slower than a than a light payload, and, and it would depend also on the thrust of the of the rocket. But as models got more and more complicated, we needed more. We needed to, the models had to become heavier to get the information in, that we needed. And uh, that meant bigger rockets or more or, or staging. So, uh, well, how, far, <clears throat> how far did they go? I mean, you, various distances, obviously. First stage would, would uh, often, a uh, small first stage would go would, uh, 100 yard, uh, well, 200 yards off the sh beach. Uh, uh, upper stages in, would, would go uh, 20 miles off the shore. And in the case of the five-stage rocket that I mentioned, that would uh, go thousands of miles. Uh, did you have to let anybody know, in other words, uh, ships at sea and uh, aircraft and so forth? Within. 10 miles or 20 miles of the shoreline, we, we, we were required to uh, scan for, for shipping and make sure that the shipping was not endangered by, uh, be, before we could launch. That was a constraint on launch. That was imposed by the Coast Guard, and we honored it. But past that, the uh, it was the, the, the uh, chance of hitting a, a ship was so remote that nobody worried about it. And uh, so the same with aircraft? Infantism. Oh, yes. Aircraft uh, were, were also scanned by radar to make sure that there were none in the vicinity. Um, you talked a little bit about some uh, really memorable, important tests which uh, were, were carried out with that uh, system and uh, resulted in the development of, as I understand it, the, the uh, application of the area rule to aircraft. Uh, I think one of them was B-58 models that you were testing. Can you talk about that? Well, the B-58 was designed by Convair, and it was a revolutionary uh, bomber that initially w w had a, a, a platform that uh, with a with a a bomb or a and a cell uh, underneath it that would be be released at the target and if and the, the released bomb would would fly hundreds of miles to the target and th this combination it, it 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 had four jet engines mounted under the under the wing it was a delta wing. And the, the, the 
we had a we we were, to, we were requested to test a model of it that was about five feet in span, and that took a, a revolutionary type of launch system called an underslung booster because it, the the wing on that thing was so big that you couldn't put it on the end of a rocket. The, the bending forces would be sufficient to uh, b make it unstable. And you couldn't stack up the stages because they, it, would, it was too big a lift up front to, uh, to uh, be stable. So by putting a underslung boosters with the nozzles canted, you could fire it uh, through, the C, through, through the CG without uh, eliminate the bending moments. But anyway, that test in it, that, that revolutionary test system was uh, uh, distinctive in itself. And when we got the results, it worked. And when we got the results back, the uh, measured drag was twice as high as Convair predicted it would be at sonic speed. And what year was that uh, roughly? Oh, this must have been in. 56 and nine, eight, that is nine, yeah 1956 the I reduced the data and got the the uh, drag profile from you know Mach 0.4 up to Mach 2 and sh the uh, but the tra the transonic drag was twice as high as it should have been the sonic speed was was also twice as high not the sonic the supersonic speed this caused great uh, consternation, and in, in, in had I re had I reduced the data improperly, had I left out a divisor of two, and if I answered that question ten times, I answered it a thousand. But I finally said, "This is it." Went down to the boss with this data, and it, it, and and he was uh, he didn't believe it. Uh, he uh, and he asked me the same: "Did you leave out a two? It so happened that uh, John Stack, the uh, the uh, division chief of the eight-foot tunnel where the area rule had been developed by Dick Whitcomb, was uh, came into the meeting, and he was perceptive enough to say, "Hey, this looks like it might be an area concentration in that in that model, that airplane model." That uh, would be would be adversely affect peak drag at transonic speed. So uh, this is the air rule hadn't even been promulgated at that point, but of course Stack knew about it from his position. So we took and redesigned that uh, airplane uh, and rebuilt it to have a favorable area rule. Which meant staggering the engines and putting in a coke bottle fuselage and making the wing uh, uh, diamond shape instead of uh, delta wing, and had it built and tested in a month. It was a, another little crash program of, of great interest, and we tested. Sure enough, the uh, the. Uh, drag profile was exactly what we predicted it would be and uh, it absolutely astonished the, the the aeronautical world including Convair and they took this this work that two or three of us had done uh, and put 3,000 engineers to work redesigning that airplane and uh, in the a, a, a configuration similar to the one that we had uh, suggested. So that was kind of nice to know that we had an impact on on that airplane, and it was subsequently produced by by the hundreds and and uh, remained in service for many years in the Air Force as, as the B-58 Hustler. So this would be the first area ruled aircraft, is that right? I think so. Yeah. It preceded. Yeah. Preceded the F-102. Well, the 102 uh, was also produced by Convair, and of course, the, they, when they saw w w it the potential for the new design, they retrofitted the 102 and made it into the 106 with a coke bottle fuselage and a 
and the same principles uh, applied to alleviate the, the uh, drag. You, <clears throat> other aircraft that you uh, tested that way, the models, uh, included uh, what were some of the others that uh, we would know uh, supersonic perhaps that you found out what was going to happen when they went supersonic? Well, I did a lot of work on the uh, on a missile that subsequently is known as the Sparrow and is in the is presently in the inventory in all the services in the Air Force and uh, in the Air Force. And uh, it was a double delta uh, um, configuration with a with a uh, delta mid wing and a delta tail wing in cruciform form, and I, uh, d d you know, developed the, the drag and uh, lift and stability derivatives of that configuration and using various wing forms and various ring sections. And that information, w you know, was utilized to finalize the design of that thing still flying. Uh, what's it, what type of missile is it? Is it Air, no, it's uh, a it's an air-to-air -air missile air -to -air. called the Sparrow. It's an it's a radar seeker. And uh, the Polaris missile, which uh, initially way back uh, in the early days of of uh, the Polaris submarines, uh, had a uh, was a. a uh, with a small missile that carried an, an atomic weapon, and it was very important. The, the nose shape of that was very important because if it was pointed, uh, it would come in faster than was desired. If it was blunt, flat, it would come in slower and could be attacked or shot down. So the idea was to take and, and get a, con a configuration that would it would enter at the the exact uh, well, the, uh, the approximate speed that they were looking for, which is around Mach one. And so I I uh, fired a series of tests with various node shapes to to uh, identify the uh, node shape that would provide the proper or the desired entry speed. And that found its way into the Polaris for years until that was re missile was retired, and they now got much much more advanced uh, uh, atomic weapons on submarines. Uh, let me back up just briefly to again to the models, and uh, uh, what was the question? I, I know that visitors to the tell me about the visitors to the uh, Wallops Island Center, Congress, uh, congressional visits, and so forth. What was one of the first questions that they'd ask when they appeared? Uh, Wallops Island <clears throat> was kind of a glamorous place, and uh, it, it, a lot of congressmen and and uh, celebrities uh, w would come there for a tour, and there wasn't much to see except the sand and the and the launch launchers and the instrumentation rooms. But when they saw a model, uh, they would the first question they'd ask is, uh, "You mean you don't retrieve these rockets?" Uh, uh, but, and that was one of the reasons why uh, Wallace Island was so successful, because we didn't worry about the complexities of trying to retrieve a model. We just launched it, measured the measured the uh, uh, parameters that we were after, and let it crash into the ocean, and built another replacement. Uh, uh, retrieving models would require a fleet to go catch them, and it would make it would add weight and complexity, and it was and it would there were uh, the, the beauty of these rocket systems was that their their basic simplicity. So that was a cheaper way to go than trying to retrieve. Cheaper and more effective in the long run. Yeah. Uh, after the. the what happened after that when the, the model, the launches from Wallops Island kind of uh, tapered off? What was your next area of study? The, uh, there was a natural uh, evolution uh, from launching research rockets into de the development of the scout 
vehicle, four-stage uh, launch platform that could put 300 pounds in a 300-mile orbit. We designed and, and uh, uh, built that rocket from uh, scratch uh, using exi existing uh, rocket motors when we could, like surplus uh, Nike uh, rockets, which anti-aircraft rockets, or when necessary, we would contract for building a, 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 a specific rocket for one of the stages. The, we had to develop uh, a control system and a guidance system. And this used a strapped down inertial platform that uh, w was state of the art and uh, guided the missile along a ballistic arc, just maintained it on a ballistic arc. And it, we, we that, that uh, guidance system was developed by Honeywell and we installed it. We, added, we used peroxide jets to, con to provide the uh, writing moments for maintaining the, the uh, stages on course. The uh, uh, bigger the, the big jets had uh, big 500 pound thrust jets that would pulse on and off to keep it stabilized on path. The, and the upper stages would use smaller jets of 15, 20 pounds, and two pounds. And would, they, the jets were required to, to control it in pitch, yaw, and roll. So there were m m m uh, quite a lot of them. And we used a peroxide system because it was simple. You take pure peroxide and run it over a silver screen and it immediately decomposes into steam and uh, oxygen, I guess with water, or steam and oxygen, and provides thrust to uh, provide a corrective moment. Uh, it's, it was a pretty crude system, uh, but it worked. And that was the advantage. This was supposed to be a inexpensive and uh, simple system. And, it, and uh, for its time, it, it was uh, inexpensive and simple, but it got uh, the, the the advance of technology kind of called it caused it to become obsolete in a matter of 20 years, but over that 20-year period, we flew uh, 170 or so uh, of, the, of those configuration that configuration. Uh, it sounds like <clears throat> the uh, vehicle would not follow a ballistic trajectory on its own. That if you didn't have these corrections, that it it would follow some other path. Is, is that correct? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, we, the, see, as you fired these stages, the <clears throat> you had uh, to keep it on the path that you wanted. The ballistic, the ballistic path was such that when it got to orbital altitude, it was flying horizontal uh, relative to the Earth. If the ballistic path had deviated, then it would not be flying horizontal. It would be flying pitch down or pitch up, and and the orbit w you know would be eccentric or wouldn't be achieved at all. So it was pretty important to maintain the path that we desired at the insertion point. Would this have a relationship to the uh, guidance systems of the missiles, the intercontinental ballistic missiles? Similar equipment, or no? They don't use it. They didn't use a strap-down inertial guidance system. They use in, they use iner they use a pure inertial guidance systems that uh, are very very sophisticated. That use uh, gyros and uh, accelerometers to maintain a very very precise path. Uh, 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 any path. It wouldn't have to be a ballistic path. Uh, you talked about uh, studies of heating on, uh, for example, the development of the blunt nose on a re-entry uh, missile, presumably. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Why, why the blunt nose? As, as speeds increased, uh, the, the uh, 
heating phenomenon became a, a pacing technology. Because, uh, well, just take a, the Concorde that f flies at Mach 2 at 50,000 feet, the temperature on the skin, on the nose of the Concorde is 350 degrees. So you can imagine, and and the, and the heat goes up as the as the uh, square of the speed. So as you go faster and faster, the temperatures you've got to deal with be, uh, become it, it become a problem because aluminum melts at 600 degrees, and uh, you you've got to provide protection for 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 material. You can use um, uh, titanium, which is uh, uh, good for a couple thousand degrees, or you can use uh, carbon or plastics and or or ablation uh, materials that that will uh, uh, radiate heat. But it, back then we didn't know about all those fancy uh, 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 techniques that are now routine. We had to, to explore the the uh, basic principles of heat transfer on uh, simple models to establish the, the validity of the theory. And we spent some time uh, shooting models uh, at high speeds to do that. And that Mach, that Mach 15 model that I mentioned was a, indeed, was a heat transfer experiment that had a three-faceted fa uh, nose cone with different surfaces to in, to in order to measure the effect of three different parameters on heating at that speed range. And that was a useful experiment that tied down the uh, a theoretical development that a guy named H. Julian Allen had come up with. And he predicted that heating would be proportional to the radius of curvature of the nose, and it was turned out to be validated by our experiments. So it, it, it compare the pointed, a pointed nose to a rounded nose for a re-entry vehicle. The, uh, um, 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 uh, see. the heating was proportional to the radius of curvature of the nose. Now a flat nose w would, uh, is, is infinitely infinite curvature, but I mean, it, 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 that has its disadvantage also because around the edges of, the, of that flat play, uh, thing, the, uh, uh, you'd get local effects that would cause local heating. So uh, some, and as you go up from flatness to a, a semicircle, uh, and then from beyond that, you go to a ogive and to a pointed nose. You you find that there are optimum. There's an optimum region somewhere less than a semicircle, but more than a flat. And uh, that's the kind of shape that was used on the Mercury capsule, eventually, for instance. And you, you worked at one point on the Viking program, is that correct? After I, uh, I was on the, on the um, scout program, I was the uh, uh, operations manager and the launch director for the, uh, conducting the launch of these uh, rockets. Um, and after we got that nailed down and and turned the operation over to the contract tr contractor, I uh, stayed around for a, a year or so to uh, set that up, and then I got moved to the Viking project, to uh, in which was in the exploratory stage at that time. And the Viking project was a project to land two spacecraft on Mars. And uh, it, it started off as a, as a grandiose project that would use the Saturn V, and that's the, sat, that's the, r the rocket that launched the Apollo, 
you would use two Saturn V's to launch each of one each for the for each of those two missiles to Mars. That was extravagantly expensive. It soon became realistic that you couldn't do it that way. Uh, so we had to scale down the the uh, scope of, of the. of the launcher to uh, b be more realistic. And my, my work on the Viking was involved with, with uh, the sc scaling, that, scaling it down to, be, make it, to be realistic. And I was, I, I was on Viking for maybe three or four years. And uh, by the, it stabilized the configuration. And then uh, I got transferred to a, the, the, then the Viking project proceeded w then without me to its uh, successful conclusion over the next several years, and they did indeed launch the uh, the two landed the two uh, orbiters on uh, on Mars and they were, and there's with with complete success, but uh, I was not involved with the with the. Uh, latter stages of the operation, just the early planning and, and evolution of the original, uh, of the new design. After that, I got transferred to a design, uh, space vehicle design criteria program. That lasted about, I don't know, five or six, seven years, where we, tra we took and, and, and tried to prepare monographs that would define the design criteria for very, all aspects of s space design, heating, uh, uh, strength, uh, materials, uh, electronics, operations, um, and I, we uh, worked on uh, about 112 different subjects, and we would collect uh, national, international experts to take and try and write down everything they knew about a particular subject in order to define a standard for subsequent use by the next designer. Uh, I, mean, I we think he did about 112 such monographs that would be extensively uh, reviewed by peers by, by national experts, and uh, and then published for wide distribution to the airspace industry. But as much as you try and define, it, 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 uh, technology is too elusive a, a subject where you could ever expect to define something definitively forever. Because as fast as you do that, as you as you, uh, the, as you write such a monograph, it would become obsolete by a new development or a new technology. So how, how long did, uh, did that project last? Oh, about five years, uh, something like that. Uh, and after that, I, got, I moved back into airplane research in an in a airplane operating program, operating where we had a 737, airplane. It actually was the first 737 ever built, and it was a test model that Boeing gave to Langley, and we uh, used, utilized it to uh, do research in aircraft operating problems. At the time, the uh, uh, aircraft industry was, was uh, expanding greatly. The uh, Traffic was in, was in, increasing, and and traffic control was a serious problem. So one of the things we uh, pioneered in that airplane was the, the use of an all glass cockpit, in which you use a, a, a CRT tube to display information instead of the traditional electromechanical uh, dials on an, in an airplane. What kind of tubes were those? The, the CRT, what is that? A, a cathode ray tube, which a little television tube. And you could put a lot of information on that in a format that would be very uh, 
easy to understand and natural to in, interpret. In, instead of having dials all over the airplane, you could put a lot of information related in, in, on one CRT. We took and built a, 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 uh, to, to further that uh, activity, we built a second cockpit in the back of the airplane. And, uh, it, and in that cockpit, we put uh, a, an array of cathode ray tubes to display uh, navigation parameters, uh, flight, flight control parameters, and engine parameters. And we, would, we, we had uh, uh, a set for the pilot, a set for the co-pilot, and in the middle, a, uh, a set of engine parameters for, um, for, for that they both could look at. And this was a, a really a revolutionary uh, uh, application of technology to try and make the the uh, cockpit fly, flying job easier. But it was but it, pilots in general resisted even thinking about it. They didn't need any. They can, I'm they're doing fine with what we got. Don't bother me with with improvements. Was their attitude. But. We were able to uh, not, uh, do a lot more uh, with that display than just simply provide a, a good flight control. We we were um, developing a we, we we this country was involved in a in a program to improve traffic flow around the around airports. To, to use that, they developed a thing called the the. Uh, uh, microwave landing system MLS that provided a spatial positioning uh, on the uh, and the entry portion of the runway, so that you, you instead of flying down a single narrow uh, ILS beam, which is that the standard uh, approach system for blind weather, you could fly a curved path in the MLS field. And that meant you could put more aircraft into the runway because they, you wouldn't have to line them up in one behind the other. And the Americans were developing a system, the British were, the Germans were, the Russians were, and the Aussies. And FAA requested that we, uh, the Lang uh, in the ATOPS program, help support the American system because if that system were chosen as the international standard, it would provide a great deal of uh, income to the, well, our, our industries in this country. And so we were in a selling mode to show how effective MLS, American MLS was for this purpose. And we utilized the uh, electronic displays uh, to help show that how, how they how they went together and would improve throughput and we performed uh, demonstrations uh, in uh, all over the well not all over but we've performed a major demonstration for the international community in Buenos Aires in uh, Montreal at Kennedy at Denver and uh, it, it, at the, those demonstrations, we would have uh, uh, two or three hundred people from all over the world who would we would take uh, on a ride on on, on uh, demonstration rides, so they could witness the uh, effectiveness of this technique for landing the airplane. In which case, the the airplane would be flown you know, from the back back cockpit using electronic displays. And come into a perfect touchdown after a complicated approach path that would be unthinkable with uh, traditional ILS uh, guidance. The uh, we we actually did succeed in in uh, selling that as the system. The American system was selected by the United Nations as the standard for the world. But about that time, just as it was selected, it became obsolete because of GPS and other uh, advances. Uh, 
nonetheless, the work that we had done on uh, the the uh, electronic displays were were also an eye opener, and and uh, it, it gathered acceptance of those as, from the piloting community uh, as uh, the the wave of the future. And of course, they have subsequently become absolutely standard in all commercial airplanes now. So you were using that 737 with the second cockpit uh, to demonstrate the microwave landing system? Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, describe a little bit how that second cockpit worked in the 737. Actually, they, they were flying the aircraft from that cockpit, is that right? Yes, the second cockpit was hooked up so that the you know an airplane has a an elect has a uh, electronic uh, autopilot. All airplanes, well, commercial airplanes, and you can and normally that is controlled from the front cockpit. But uh, but when we took we built this cockpit in the back of the airplane that had no view forward the the pilots up in the forward cockpit became what we call safety pilots to keep them to monitor traffic and see that nothing uh, untoward happened and to take over in the case of an emergency but in the meanwhile the guys in the back cockpit could be uh, were in control of the airplane through the uh, manually or through uh, uh, the uh, uh, autopilot, uh, and it it was spooky to be sitting. You know, it, it was it, be sitting in the back of the airplane uh, and flying this great airliner, the third seven thirty seven, uh, with uh, completely blind. But if, if we we could fly it from. We, we we could take off, fly to uh, say Denver, and land at Denver within a second of the time we programmed the landing. Uh, or we could uh, perform a, a, a zigzag approach around hazards uh, and make a landing uh, at any airport. In the world, using the and that was that had was equipped with MLS. Uh, nowadays, you can do the same thing, but if, if you chose to using GPS, uh, and generally people don't, but they could if they if it were appropriate. You actually did some of the flying yourself, did you? Well, I would I would uh, uh, on the way home from an operation, you know, I would get a little stick time in because the pilots were kind enough to let me. But uh, I had no role in, in flying the airplane. We had professional test pilots to do that. You also did some other studies, as I understood, in the air transport program. Uh, they involved wind shear, is that correct? Yeah, wind shear is a big problem and associated with thunderstorms. Uh, when a thunderstorm, in a thunderstorm, there is a great upflow of uh, of air uh, in in the middle of the thunderstorm, and the air on either side of it is is sucked in uh, in the big funnel that goes up. When you're making an an approach, uh, if a thunder you can be in a position such that the uh, wind is, how do I want to say this? Normally when you, you land an airplane into the wind, uh, um, you don't, uh, and, and, you, and you want to avoid landing downwind because the relative flow over the wing is, is, is increased when you're landing into the wind if you uh, are landing in, 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 with the with wind downwind, the the airflow over the wing diminishes, and you lose lift, and it becomes uh, uh, you you lose and and lose flying speed. 
and and, th and that's what happens in a w when um, in a wind shear. The wind changes direction on the approach from blowing at you to blowing with you, and when that happens, you lose lift. And if it happens quickly enough, your pilot can't recover. And there have been a number of accidents in which that was the cause of a crash. So we were able to take and, and develop a, a technique by using r radar, forward-looking radar and forward-looking infrared that would measure the speed of the air particles, aerosol particles in the air ahead of the airplane, measure those two or three miles ahead of the airplane, display them on, a, on the electronic display to, uh, so the pilot would know, would have an uh, indication of uh, a change in the in the wind speed sufficiently a ahead uh, to make a correction or go round. And what are aerosols? Little particles in the air, little dust. Dust. Yes, could be. Oh, okay. Moisture. Any water? moisture. And uh, you conducted some demonstrations of that. We conducted a um, demonstration at Denver a, a number of times in which we would go out and look for thunderstorms uh, to, because th there is a, at Denver in the summer, there is a, there are a high incidence of thunderstorms. And, and, and uh, so we went where the thunderstorms were and tried to uh, fly the airplane, not land it, but just fly it into the, into the thunderstorms to see if we could measure the, uh, the uh, wind speed ahead of the airplane and uh, if we could, so that we could display it and make, take corrective actions. That was a pretty dangerous uh, thing because of the potential for, um, you know, for, for hurting the airplane. But we had enough precautions that we felt that we could do it safely and did and proved that the sensors worked. And they, those sensors are now used in, in uh, commercial airplanes as landing aids for a wind, sense, for wind shear. Well, looking back on your career after you retired in 1991, uh, let me ask you, what do you think was the most significant development that you worked on in terms of the progress of aviation or space travel? I had a series of incremental uh, accomplishments that I thought were pretty uh, interesting, but the march of technology, uh, they, they become rather trifling anymore. The uh, development of the underslung booster, the uh, area rule demonstration, the uh, development of that uh, a scout launch vehicle provided a lot of uh, valuable information for subsequent de uh, designers to utilize. The design criteria program has a, f has a number of monographs that are still valid. And the, the uh, work on the uh, air transport operating systems program, uh, developing those electronic displays in the cockpit were um, uh, a landmark uh, uh, technology uh, accomplishment. The uh, and the uh, wind shear sensor was was uh, important. So there's a lot of little important things that I contributed to that uh, were fun to develop and uh, and uh, I'm pleased to see that they're working still. How about the most frustrating project or projects? Well, you know, I didn't. I, I, I'd be assigned uh, to to, uh, to do something, and uh, because the need was there, I'd be assigned, and I would uh, not particularly like uh, doing heat transfer, for instance. 
But I, once I, I, I adapted to it and found that it was a, a challenge that was just as interesting as what the work I had been doing on stability and control prior to that. So I accommodated the changes and I didn't let them bug me. And I was real fortunate to have all a, a series of, of uh, fascinating uh, assignments that uh, uh, were, were challenging and interesting to me. And I was very, very lucky compared to some fellows who might have had to spend their entire career in a wind tunnel. Is there anything more that you would like to add? Because we're just about at the uh, end of the session here. Any anything we didn't cover that you would like to uh, mention? No, I said uh, one little thing. Going back to the very first thing, when I came to Langley, I I intended uh, uh, on my motorcycle, I intended to uh, stay a year and saving up money to buy a car and go to California and get a job as a test pilot. But I got, I got so interested in what I was doing that I abandoned that project and uh, incidentally met the girl of my dreams. So here I am uh, 60 years later still here. Yeah, the girl of your dreams, she, she, she was from here, from the area? She was from Southern Maryland. She was working, got a job at Langley as a mathematician.